everyone, I'm Roger Patterson. I serve here at Grace Fellowship Church as one of the elders alongside my lovely wife, Becky. And we have three kids and a daughter-in-law in our household, as well as my mother and father-in-law who live with us. We've been here with the church for about 15 years. I uh, love serving alongside you. Today, I get the joy of teaching the doctrine of the Bible to you. And that's a huge doctrine. So we're gonna be focusing on two aspects only, the authority of the Bible and the sufficiency of the Bible. So we're gonna be asking two basic questions. Where did the Bible come from and what is the Bible good for? So let's jump into that first question, where does the Bible come from? One of the common claims that we hear from skeptics is that the Bible is just merely a book that was written by men. It's like all the other religious texts and it's maybe written by a bunch of Bronze Age goat herders and they simply wrote down their ideas. It's no more trustworthy than any other book that we have and we shouldn't be using it as a guidebook to dictate our lives. And it surely didn't come down from God and there's no inspired text in there. Let's listen to a quote from Richard Dawkins from his book, The God Delusion, that lays this out a little bit. To be fair, much of the Bible is not systematically evil, but just plain weird, as you would expect of a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents composed, revised, translated, distorted, and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors, and copyists, unknown to us and mostly unknown to each other, spanning nine centuries. And many people claim that this is indeed how the Bible came to us. And the game of telephone is often used as an analogy, that the Bible was given to us by oral tradition and that people handed it down. And there have been lots of corruptions in the text over time, and we can't really trust the Bible in that sense. But is that really a true claim? Well, that's not what the Bible claims about itself. The Bible's testimony of itself is very different. In the Bible, we see hundreds of times phrases like, thus says the Lord. And if we look to the New Testament, Jesus, who is God in flesh, we read all, all over the place, Jesus said, Jesus spoke these words to them. So we have very clear statements in the text of the Bible that this is indeed the word of God. It's not just a container for the word of God. It doesn't contain the words of God but it is the very word of God. But why should we trust a book that just claims on its face to be its own authority? To help answer that question, I want to tell a bit of my story. I was actually raised as a Mormon and became an atheist later. I recognized a lot of the plastic fake nature inside of the Mormon faith, and I wanted nothing to do with God if that's what religion was. So I turned away from God, went to a lifestyle of partying and drinking and pornography and pursued those things and the, and the lusts of my flesh for many years. And it was only after a period of time recognizing some of the uh, terrible things that were happening in the world around me. A friend got paralyzed at a party I was supposed to be at, uh, driving home drunk, and some other things were happening around me. I realized I really didn't want that to be my life. But it wasn't because of any godly notion. I just didn't want those negative consequences in my life. But another providential thing happened that year. This cute Christian girl showed up at my school and we started dating. And she started reading to me from her little Precious Moments Bible. And I also had a, a good friend whose father was a deacon at a Lutheran church. And he was feeding me books and talking to me about the things of God, challenging my thinking, pointing me to God as a trustworthy source. As I was dealing with all of these thoughts, thinking through all of these things, there was still this notion in my head, I really don't need God. I can be good without God. I don't need the Bible to tell me what's right and wrong. I can figure these things out on my own. I was pursuing a career as a scientist, training to be an evolutionary biologist. I understood the world through the lens of evolution as the truth. I sought science to be the determiner of truth. I was determined that that was the way I was gonna understand the world around me and how everything operated. I was determined that man was the measure of all things. I knew that I could figure all these things out through the scientific method. And I pursued those things wholeheartedly. 
It wasn't until after college, when I was faced with my own hypocrisy, uh, when I began attending church regularly, because I had pretended to be a Christian all those years to get married to my wife and, and many things. Uh, we can talk about that over coffee sometime if you'd like. But basically, I had become the same fake plastic hypocrite in the Baptist church we were attending that I had hated in the Mormon church. So I had this question to answer, and the Bible was at the center of it. If the Bible claims to be the Word of God, and it does, and if it's the Word of God, all of it is true or none of it's true. That summer I decided I was going to sit down and read the Bible and study it and apply my scientific training and my logical mind to determine whether the Bible was really true. Is this really the Word of God? Is it accurate in everything that it claims or does it contradict itself? So I was studying and as you can imagine, <laughs> rather than determining all of these things were false, God was convicting me of my sin, the Holy Spirit doing that work, and I recognized the glory of Christ in the pages of Scripture as my heart was being changed and my mind was being transformed. Now this didn't come about simply because I had analyzed these things with my rational thinking, but because God was doing a work in me as I sought to understand these things through the pages of Scripture. And we know that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that's the work that the Bible did in my heart through that study that summer. Now, we can hear these stories repeated with various people trying to examine the text, and those are good ways to, to think about how we challenge one another, uh, challenge skeptics in thinking about the Bible. But it's ultimately a matter of faith. I didn't come to believe the Bible is true because I was smart enough to figure it out, and I applied my logical analysis and my scientific training. I came to believe the Bible is true because God brought faith into my heart, and that faith made the Bible real to me. It made me understand that His Word is trustworthy, it's reliable, and it's true. And it's that faith that I now exercise. I put my faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and now I trust fully that the Bible is the Word of God. And it's only by faith that we can truly recognize the authority of Scripture. So no matter who we are or what background we come from, we ultimately have to exercise faith. When I sit in a chair, I'm exercising faith in that chair that it's going to hold me up. When I look to the Bible, I'm exercising faith that it contains the truth from God and it's going to reveal those things to me that I need to understand how to live a godly life. The same is true of an atheist or a skeptic or a Buddhist or a Mormon or anyone. Anyone who has a worldview has to put faith in some type of system. When I was an atheist, I wasn't putting faith in anything or nothing. Okay? Faith isn't just some random thing that we do. Faith is always directed at an object. I was putting my faith in my professors, in my own ability to do scientific analysis and understand those things. I was putting my faith in the worldview of scientism. So all of those things were directed at that specific belief system. Now that faith has been transferred from that worldview to the worldview of Christianity. Now I understand the Bible as that authority rather than those notions of science. But that doesn't mean that I've abandoned my love for science. I still love science. I'm a science educator. I enjoy teaching about those things, but now I do it from the perspective that God has created all those things, and when we do science, we're understanding God. We're thinking God's thoughts after him, as Johannes Kepler said. And that doesn't mean that we don't have good reasons to trust the Bible and to trust the truth claims of Christianity. All those things are reasonable and true as well. But if we think about it, why would we put our trust in the fallible ideas of man? Science and philosophy are constantly changing all the time, but God does not. He's the only one who is faithful and true. He's the one who has created us and the universe we live in. He's the one who we can trust to know the past and the present and the future, and he's the only one that it's reasonable to trust, and he's the only one that it's reasonable to look to as an absolute authority in all these areas. One of my favorite artists is Peter Mark Monstead. 
And when I think about his paintings, they are truly inspiring, and I think of him as an inspired artist. When I think about one of his paintings, like A Stream with a Deer, it's amazing how lifelike it is. And I wonder, is that a photograph or is it reality? But when we think about the word inspired with respect to the Bible, we think about it in a very different way than when we talk about artists being inspired in a dance or in a poem or to make a sculpture. All those things that we think of as creative acts, we're doing as image bearers of God, and we're creating things that reflect God's glory in those ways. But that's not the sense that we think of inspired when we talk about the Bible. So let's break down that misconception a little bit as we think about that. If we look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we read in that passage, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So did you hear that word in there? Inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, this is an interesting word. The word inspired in that verse in other translations like the ESV is translated as God breathed. So the process of inspiration, physiologically, when we inspire, we breathe in, when we expire, we breathe out. So what this word really means is to expire, to breathe out, God breathed. But it would sound really weird if the translator said, the Bible is expired, because that just doesn't make sense, okay? That's not the sense we're talking about. So what we mean in this sense, the Greek word that we're translating here, theopneustos, is theos, God, neustos, breathed. It's breathed out by God. So when we think about the Bible and the words of Scripture, these are the very God-breathed words that are revealed to us on the pages of Scripture. Another passage that helps us understand this idea of inspiration comes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for we received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who has directed these men who wrote the Bible to record those things that God intended for us. So when we answer that question, where does the Bible come from, we have to be honest and say, yes, it is a product of men. But it is also a product of God there's a combination of those things there. There's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit guiding those men to write those things. And we see that very clearly in the words of Jesus in John 14, 26. Speaking to his disciples on the night of his betrayal, he said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the writings that we have are God-breathed or inspired, not the individuals. So this is the distinction from the way that we talk about artists or others being inspired in their work. It's not the Bible, um, or the men who wrote the Bible who were inspired, it's the Bible itself. But what we have is the 66 books in our Bible are the supernatural work of God through the hands of men, and it's faithfully preserved for us today. It's the revealed word of God that we look to as our authority and not the mere work of men. Now, many people have tried to prove that the Bible is true in various ways. You might have heard of archeological evidence that shows that the Bible is accurate or the scientific principles that prove that the Bible is true or that are consistent with the Bible. But should we believe that the Bible is true because we have these proofs from science or archeology span or philosophy or any other realm of study? Well, let's stop and think about that for just a second. If archeology span can prove that the Bible is true, 
or if any scientific field can prove that the Bible is true, then which one is the real authority? That makes science the authority over the Bible. That makes archaeology the authority over the Bible. So rather, we should think that those things are consistent with what we read in the Bible, and we should expect that. If the Bible is the absolute authority in every area of our lives, then the Bible is going to be consistent with what we find in archaeology, because that's going to tell us about the true history of the world around us. It's going to be consistent with what we find in nature as we study scientifically, because that's how God created the world around us. It's going to be consistent with what we find as we study humanity through um, psychology and psychiatry and those different fields. So we have to be careful that we don't use those areas to try and prove that the Bible is true, but rather we make the scripture the ultimate authority in all of those areas. And we also must consider that all of the scientists and people who are archeologists and those who are studying, those are fallible humans who have a corrupted mind that's influenced by the sin that's in the world, and they're going to be communicating corrupted truths, and there are biases present in their, in their worldviews. All of those things have to be considered as we look at truth claims that are made from the world coming outside the Bible. We have to think of the Bible as the absolute authority that's going to be the authority that judges all of those other truth claims. Now, those fields can help us support and confirm the Bible, but they can never prove that the Bible is true. So in conclusion, the Bible was written by some 40 different human authors over the span of about 2,000 years on three different continents, but it was done in a way that was supernaturally guided by the Holy Spirit. And we have that record faithful, faithfully preserved for us today in our 66 books of the Bible. And we can absolutely trust those as an authoritative, inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. And we can look to that as the source of truth today. You can pause the video here and take some time to consider the discussion questions that you have before you. So in this section, we're going to answer the question, what is the Bible good for? So we're going to be talking about the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. When I say that something's sufficient, what comes to your mind? Now, if I needed a 7 16th wrench to turn a bolt, I might only have a pair of vice grip pliers or channel lock pliers that I can get on there, and that would be sufficient. Or maybe your kid comes to you and they've got a presentation tomorrow and they've got to have a costume and that mop head is going to have to be sufficient to serve as a wig because that's the only thing you can come up with on the spot. But when we speak about sufficiency of scripture, we're talking about something much different than that. We're talking about something above and beyond the bare bones of what we need. It's an entire sufficiency that gives us an abundant supply to live a life that's pleasing to God. So let's look at 2 Peter 1, verses 1 through 11, and see what we can learn about the sufficiency of Scripture from this passage. We're going to start out with the introduction that Peter gives here and read through this passage. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. 
For so an assurance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now verse 3 says God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So there's a fullness and a sufficiency in what he provides for us. And this leads us to blessing in this life as we obey and follow those commands and we receive those promises from God and ultimate blessing in the eternal life when we get to enjoy that uh, state with him forever. This fullness, this passage tells us, comes to us in the knowledge of God as we get to know God. But that forces us to ask the question, how do we know God? How do we come to know who God is? And the answer is, God has revealed himself to us. God has been kind to us to reveal himself to us. He's done that in multiple ways. We can know a little bit about who God is because he's revealed himself to us in his creation. We can see his invisible attributes, his divine power and eternal nature in the creation around us. And we can get a glimpse of who God is. But he has most fully revealed himself to us in two ways, in the person of Christ, who is God in the flesh. But we only know about who Jesus was living today because we have those things recorded for us in scripture. We have the Bible where the gospels tell us about who Jesus was. And we have the Old Testament telling us about all the things that were recorded for us during the time of the Old Covenant. So we have those two sections of our Bible that talk about that Old Covenant time and the time now under the Gospels and under the New Covenant where we have that fullness of God revealed to us, a great blessing to us as we have that full revelation of who God is and what we can know about him. Now, that doesn't mean we know everything about God. There's still much more we will get to learn and explore about him, but we have all that we need, as the passage clearly tells us, that pertains to life and godliness. So as we study scripture, we come to know who God is as Father, Son, and Spirit, and we see the promises that he's made to us and how we can translate those promises into living a faithful life that's pleasing to him and then receiving those blessings as we do so. So all things that pertain to life and godliness we've been given as we grow and change and we're transformed into the image of Christ. So those are the ways that scripture clearly teaches the sufficiency of scripture for the things that we need for life and godliness. But there's a common misconception. This doesn't mean the, that the Bible is an exhaustive manual for everything. Okay? So when we talk about the sufficiency of scripture, it's not a science textbook that teaches us how the planets orbit or how the heart beats or how to change the brakes on my pickup truck. Okay? It's not exhaustive in that, that sense that it's sufficient for everything that we could ever want to know or do. It's sufficient for all things that pertain to life and godliness. But where it does teach on the ideas of scientific principles or things about humanity and other areas of study, we can trust that it's accurate in those areas. So if you have a physics test coming up next week, don't expect to find the answers in the Book of Lamentations, even though that might be the book that's gonna match your mood after you see your grade or in the middle of the test. Okay? But that doesn't mean we can't draw principles and truths from the Bible to apply with wisdom to all areas of life. And there's not a specific section of the Bible, there's not a chapter and verse that we can go to that tells us how to set up a, the legal structure if you're a business owner or how to file your taxes for that business. But there are many helpful principles that are gonna teach you about how to treat people as you interact with your employees and vendors and other clients and your, your clientele, uh, how to view your money as you're dealing with money, and how to honor God above all things in your business transactions. So those are principles that we can draw in uh, from scripture and apply with wisdom across all areas of life. But as I mentioned in the section on authority, when the Bible does speak on a subject, we must acknowledge it as the authority on that subject. Many today, even within the church, are trying to deny things like the historicity of Adam and Eve 
or even subvert the doctrines of original sin or substitutionary atonement based on ideas like biological evolution and other things. They say that man evolved over billions of years from simple creatures into ape-like creatures and into humanity and try to blend modern ideas from modern naturalistic science into the Bible. They're integrating those ideas together. But the Bible's clear that God created man supernaturally and that we didn't evolve from some previous creature. So we can see the Bible's sufficiency in affirming those truths and refuting those claims of modern naturalistic science and say that God created man in his image supernaturally just as we see recorded in scripture. So there's an instance where the Bible is sufficient to answer some of those claims that are brought to us from the world. So when it comes to how to live a life that's pleasing to God, the Bible has everything that we need to know. When it comes to areas like uh, practical things of everyday living, that's where we have to draw um, ideas of wisdom out of the Bible and apply those things with a heart of wisdom and often doing those things in community and seeking wisdom from one another as we do that. You've heard it countless times from our teaching pulpits on Sunday morning or if you've been to our counseling and discipleship training, we can learn how to help real people with real problems using our Bibles. And that's really one of the heartbeats of Grace Fellowship Church. We trust that God has equipped to use his church in that very way. And as the elders, Ephesians 4 tells us, that's, that's one of our tasks. We are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We're not the professionals who do everything on our own, but it's every Christian's responsibility to be loving one another and doing those things at close range in places like your community groups. As we gather in community groups and other one-on-one -on -one discipleship opportunities, it's the Word of God cooperating with the Spirit of God as we're in communion with one another and with God through those various methods that that change begins to happen. We see conviction of sin and we see the, the methods for change outlined in Scripture and we can apply those things. It's the sufficiency of Scripture that we trust can be applied in those situations. We don't need to be looking to the world to give us the methods to grow and change and transform in those ways. Now, we believe that valuable things can be learned from the science of psychology and the physiology of the body and how people respond to various stressful situations and circumstances and lots of different important things. But when those fields start from the wrong worldview, one that denies God's existence or the biblical nature of man or the existence and nature of sin as revealed in scripture, we must reject their methods and conclusions. We don't participate with worldly philosophies and integrate them into the church. If we do so, we show by our actions that we don't really believe that the Bible is sufficient when it comes to growing in godliness. Rather, we should start our thinking and formulate our actions and counsel from the Word of God, dependent on the Spirit to bring conviction of sin and transformation into the image of Christ to the glory of God the Father. Here's how Paul made that idea clear to the Colossian church. Let's look at Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. We can trust that the word of God doesn't need any worldly philosophies added into it. And when we do so, we're only bringing a snare into our thinking, and we're going to corrupt what God's word says. So we want to make sure that the Bible is our foundation as we think through those things, how we grow and change. Now, many people often look for experiences as they're trying to understand who God is and as they're trying to grow in their faith. And this is another thing that we hear teaching from all the time in the pulpit. As Pastor Brad exhorts us constantly, we need to be looking to the Word, 
We need to be having intimate time in the text with Jesus, with our Bibles open in prayer, spending that unhurried time in communion with God. And that's a word I need to hear. I need to be convicted of those things and reminded of those things as well. But let me ask you a question. Many people might think, if God spoke to me out loud right now, I would obey exactly what he said because it's God's word right to me. Okay, but stop and think about that for a second. If you're reading the scriptures, if you open up the Bible and you read a command from the scriptures, and you believe as a Christian that the Bible is God's God breathed the word to you, then aren't you really hearing God's voice? And if you want to hear God speak out loud, just read your Bible out loud, okay? So if we say that we do these things if God spoke out loud to us, we might be deceiving ourselves and we need to stop and really evaluate our hearts and think about that. Are we really speak, seeking an experience that we think is going to change us and transform us in some way? that's different than what the text says. A faithful devotion to scripture is probably going to be more powerful as we seek to transform our minds. Here's what I would suggest. As you read, open your Bible, get ready to read that, that section of text. Pray that the Spirit would make the word come alive to you. Ask the Spirit, who is God, to make these words come alive to you, to convict you of sin, to transform your mind. We know that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. As we read in 2 Peter earlier, Peter himself, who had experienced the transfiguration on the mountain, he saw Jesus transfigured into glory, into his glorious form. He heard the voice of God the Father from heaven. He saw Moses and Elijah there on the mountain. That experience must have been magnificent. Who wouldn't want to be there? Wonderful, glorious time. But rather than pointing his uh, readers to seek out experiences like that, what did Peter point them to? He said, we have this more sure word or this word confirmed, and he's pointing them to the text of scripture. That's where we need to be turning our focus. We turn our focus to scripture, trusting that it is absolutely sufficient by the power of the spirit to transform our hearts, to transform our minds. And as those things happen, our affections and our actions, the way we speak, the way we think, all of those things will be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. So as we conclude, we can be sure that the word of God is sufficient and that God has given us all that we need to walk worthy of the calling that we have been called to. And we don't need to seek worldly philosophies and try to integrate those into the Bible. We don't need to seek mystical experiences and try to add them to our Christian walk. We have all that we need in the sufficient word of God. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have the promises and blessings of the Father to transform us and to conform us into the image of his beloved Son. And we have everything that we need in those things. So as we think about this topic and you want to dig in and study a little more, I trust you've all got a Bible and you can study that for yourselves. But let me recommend a few other resources that you can use. One of the things we have is Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. So there's a big version of this that you can get, but this is kind of the concise form called Bible Doctrine. So that's available in the Resource Center as well as the Expanded Systematic Theology. Uh, I work for Answers in Genesis. We've got great resources like the Answers book and other book resources, things on the website that deal with that biblical authority, looking at those things and how we can trust the Bible from the very first verse. Uh, we've got this great book that talks about some of the reasons that we believe, those things that support and confirm the Bible, the Bible being the absolute authority in those areas. So these things would deal with the authority of scripture. And I don't know how many resources we have on the sufficiency of scripture, but just to highlight a couple of those that we've got, this book, How People Change, is really a great resource that deals with the sufficiency of scripture and how that's gonna bring transformation into our lives. So I'd recommend that one to you. And then my favorite author, um, now deceased, but I was blessed to meet him once, Jerry Bridges, uh, this book, Dis The Discipline of Grace, uh, 
is truly a life-changing book if you want to understand how God's transforming grace changes your heart and that works into the actions of your life, strongly recommend this. So lots of other great resources too. Hope you'll take advantage of those and hope this has been a, a blessing for you to understand these things a little bit more. And now you can take some time with your group to continue discussing those discussion questions and have a blessed evening. Thank you.